recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto, Canada, a Get a Grip management production and in association with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors and presented by the National Lighting Bureau, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and the International Dark Sky Association. Added to the IES's 2021 Progress Report, this is Starving for Darkness, a podcast. This episode of Starving for Darkness is brought to you by Keystone. If you are a distributor or a contractor, go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com, keystonetech dot com. Keystone is dedicated to making dark sky friendly lighting products like the XFIT full cutoff wall pack or their high performance LED area lights which are dark sky friendly, eliminating unnecessary sky glow. The Type 3 optic package conveniently includes an adjustable pole mount kit and a three pin twist lock photo cell and a shorting cap to cover all your needs and variables. And visit keystonetech.com for all your other lighting needs. Sign solutions, emergency backup, transformers, and of course, LED retrofit kits and fixtures. Keystone has it all. Keystone, light made easy. Hello listeners and darkness lovers. Welcome to another episode of Starving for Darkness. My name is Jane Slade, and I'm so pleased to have Hilding Nielsen on the show today. Hilding is an interdisciplinary scientist at the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto, working on the intersection of science, astronomy, and indigenous knowledge. In his work, he strives to embrace and integrate indigenous knowledges and methodologies to better understand the physics of stars and the universe and our place in it. Hilding, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So we start every show with the same request, which is to please tell us about a dark sky experience that left you with a feeling of awe. Well, I have a very recent one. I was fortunate to be invited to attend the Jasper Dark Sky Festival uh, only a few weeks ago. And going out, leaving Toronto where the sky is never dark and going to Jasper and seeing the dark skies, seeing the mountains around us just reflects this connection with nature that, you know, I've been missing for the last few years because of uh, uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And at that event, we had a drumming session with some Cree um, knowledge keepers and they were sharing their connections to the night sky. So we're having, it felt like I was returning home in many respects. Mm. I see. And so, so much of your work, when you go on your website, the first thing you see is every star tells a story. Can you talk about what this phrase means to you and why it uh, enriches your work? Yeah. I mean, so I work in astrophysics and these days astrophysics is really becoming a study of big data where we take our telescopes and we just stare out in the space at stars, count as many stars as possible, bring them together, do statistics and analysis. But every star has its own personality, its own heritage, its own connection, whether it's the North Star being connected to different nations, uh, indigenous nations and Western society through as a guide star or as a star all of its own as with a companion and a binary system or as a classical Cepheid star, which is a pulsating star with light increases and decreases every few days. It's telling us so many different stories about ourselves, about the galaxy, about stars itself. And every star has that connection. And there are millions and billions of stars around our galaxy that we can interact with and see if we have the dark skies. And every one of those has a distinct kind of behavior personality, like every person on Earth. And, you know, I think the more we understand these stars, the the more we kind of learn about things, the history of our universe, where we come from as, you know, with the iron in our blood and, and, and the oxygen and carbon, all these things kind of relate to us in the end. It's really interesting because I have cultivated a deep love for this planet Earth that we're on and the systems and the cycles that we all take part in. But it's almost as if the way that you describe it, that you're actually 
starting to love other planets and stars for that same version of their own uniqueness. So it's interesting to see you take that to another star or another place in our universe. Well, I think that's kind of part of where we are on Earth. I mean, indigenous peoples have lived in what we call Canada in the US as time immemorial. And with the dark skies for tens of thousands of years, that's a strong connection and reflection. And what indigenous peoples, whether it's Mi'kmaq or Lakota or Salish or Inuit, were seeing in the night sky was a reflection of the land below. So the night sky was part of being part of on Earth. And so we do, have, I think that relationship has always been there. And mm -hmm. I think things like light pollution and the um, growth of Sally pollution have been disrupting those relationships and having negative impacts on the environment and on ourselves as human beings. Yes. I, I have uh, been saying recently that starlight is the birthright right of all living things. And um, in, in getting to know you and your work, I, I have been really understanding now that the storytelling around the stars has um, been monopolized by certain um, schools of thought. And so the term uh, astrocolonialism, it, it comes up readily in your work. Can you talk about the storytelling that we are hearing versus the storytelling we're not hearing and what the disruption is doing for our connection to the stars? Yeah, I think one of the very funny things that's, and funny in a strange way that happened in the last couple centuries is astronomers keep wanting to map the night sky. And we map the night sky with constellations like Centaurus, uh, Crux, or some major or some minor. And these constellations, particularly in the Northern hemisphere, almost entirely derive from Greek and Roman stories and astronomies. Mm -hmm. And you could, we can trace these constellations back to Greek astronomers like Ptolemy and Aristotle. And we continued them going through in the, in, in the what we call the enlightenment, where these constellations became even more part of our culture thanks to patronage by royalty like the, uh, the Roman Emperor and the King of England and all that stuff, creating all these different sky maps. But it was only about a century ago when the International Astronomical Union, which is this international grouping of all professional astronomers came together and they decided they wanted to codify and define a mapping of this night nice sky in a clear, clear way. So they brought together representatives from the main countries. They brought up a man from Britain, a man from France, a man from Germany. And it was all men, of course, being more than a century ago to do this, define what the constellations of the night sky were. And they came up with 88 constellations to define the night sky based on, in the Northern Hemisphere, primarily Greek and Roman mythologies and stories. And in doing so, they sanitized the night sky. Wow. And also created a bad joke by having a British, a Frenchman, and a, and a German meet, meet in a bar. And this changes things, because that's not the stories in North America. It's not in the North, it's not, the Big Dipper would be a caribou. Cree tell a story of a great bear and, and bird hunters, so do the Mi'kmaq, but the stories are different. Some tell stories of the fisher, some tell stories of a cradle. And those constellations reflect the people on the land that we're on. So when we teach Ursa Major, or we teach Big Dipper, or we teach these constellations like Orion, we're erasing people's place on this land and their connections to the night sky. That's incredible. And, you know, so much of the work of this show is to try and reconnect people to the night sky. Um, and my personal driving interest is, uh, well, it's wildlife to start because I think that's the critical element here in terms of climate change. But also so much of what I want to focus on is um, what is lost meditatively when we don't have that nightly practice of looking up into the sky. And so what's so interesting about your work and how you add to this is that it's not just that connection in the, in the individual, but that there's a cultural connection that's being lost in the one version of this tale that we're telling. So that's fascinating to hear. So um, can you, let's jump to what your day-to-day -day job is at U of T. Um, what do you teach? Um, what is your connection to the students? Um, what, what do you do at the University of Toronto? 
So right now I'm a uh, contract faculty at the University of Toronto and I get to do something very cool, which is I get to work and study the night sky and astronomy, looking at physics of stars in my research primarily as well and as well as looking at the interaction with exoplanets. And with teaching, I've been kind of fortunate to teach a whole bunch of different courses, a uh, history of astronomy, which largely became really is the white man history of astronomy because it, it really mm -hmm. focuses through the, Euro the European tales from, you know, of uh, Rahe and Kepler and Galileo. And it's, it's important to know these things, and, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I got to teach astrobiology, you know, looking around the universe and thinking about where we might find life. And right now I'm really fortunate to teach a course called Astronomy and Indigenous Worldviews, where I'm working with students to sort of think about how we understand the night sky and astronomy through Indigenous lenses, through different stories and through different perspectives, and to actually explore um, the interaction between professional astronomy and colonization today. So what stories are not being told that are so valuable and needed and important? essentially all of them. Uh, <laughs> we really only have the uh, European stories to go on. We tend to ignore indigenous stories. We tend to ignore indigenous stories from Africa. We tend to ignore Chinese stories and Korean stories, Hindu stories. And there's sciences embedded in all this. And from my own land, Mi'kma'ki, which is today Eastern Canada and Northeastern United States, we tell the story of the great bear and the seven bird hunters. Yeah, and that in that story, just like the Big Dipper, the four stars of the bowl is the bear, and then you go to the arm as the bird hunters, and it keeps going beyond what we think of as the Big Dipper. And in that story, we tell that throughout the year, with, you know, where we look at the night sky a few hours before dawn, so we see the Big Dipper throughout the year changing its location. And when we tell the story, we talk, start in the spring when the bear is waking up from hibernation. The first bird hunter spots the bear and realizes that the bear, the fat and the meat will feed people for, for throughout the winter and for, for a long time. So he grabs his bow and arrow, the robin grabs his bow and arrow and calls his friends. He's very quickly followed by Chickadee who grabs a pot. And the cool part about that is Chickadee and the pot are actually two different stars. And he continues down the line, bringing, they call passenger pigeon, blue jay, gray jay, barn owl, sawbat owl. So we see that connection with birds because today, the story honors the pastor pigeon who doesn't exist anymore. And we tell us, as we're telling the story, we, the hunt begins and the bear is running. And through the summer, the Big Dipper flies lot, uh, lies flat in the sky. So the bear is running across the land as the birds chase, try to make the hunt. But as the summer grows long, you know, the birds get tired. Some of them fall from the hunt and are below the horizon. Mm. And in the fall, Muin is tired. Mewen must must rest for the winter. So so Mewen turns around and growls at the at the birds. And Robin shoots, striking Mewen in the heart. Blood goes everywhere, all over Robin. Robin flies into the trees and shakes it off all over the leaves, turning the leaves red, but leaving one stain on his breast. Mewen dies. The birds gather. They they perform celebrations. They share the meals. They tell stories. They celebrate the hunt. And as, and as the, the season passes in the winter, Mewen is in the sky on its back, waiting for spring to return and, and, and the cycle renews. So the story, not only is that story not told normally, but you know, there's only so, I only know very few Mi'kmaq stories. So there, and there's a lot of constellations and stars that we don't, I don't know about. And I don't know who knows about them. Mm -hmm. Maybe, knowledge keepers and elders know some other stories maybe not but so much of our knowledge has been lost and so the more we avoid talking about these constellations the more we risk losing even that little bit of knowledge we have left of the night sky and this story then reflects to how we understand the night sky and the seasons it reflects how we understand nature and ethics for instance you don't hunt the bear in the summer you wait for the fall mm. And it's part of it, and it connects us to the night sky and to the stars. Yeah, I, I was going to kind of follow up how science is in the stories, but I understand now after hearing your story, because it's as if these constellations are kind of making their way through the sky as we go around the sun. And 
as they slowly do that, I mean, I can almost imagine the evolution of the story told night overnight, slowly progressing with each progression. It includes the momentary connection to what's happening on earth as a result of the natural daylight cycle and what is best done in those moments. So not hunting the bear in the, in the summer, but waiting till fall, perhaps because of progeny that need to be taken care of. And so that these stories are giving like vital wisdom that we're told year over year, day after day to slowly create a, a wisdom that's told through the stars. It's, it's beautiful. So what is the reaction that you get when people find that there's stories they're missing and, you know, are, are they good? Are they bad? Is it, is it everything in between? Yeah, it can be everything in between. I think a lot of reaction forms like, oh my God, I did not know this. How, you know, how did we know this? Uh, then there's, you know, the, so a lot of people see these stories as cute, nice, just, but not science. You know, they don't, un, they don't really want to engage in this sort of idea of indigenous knowledge as being science where these stories have scientific merit from their perspective. And in some cases, just I write denial or apathy. Um, you know, for a lot of people, I think recognizing constellations or indigenous anything is a very difficult thing to do these days. Uh, you know, we're so embedded in this sort of Western narrative when it comes to just about everything we do, that having someone say, that's not the Big Dipper, that's Muon, or that's the Cree constellation or an Indian constellation is very much hard to accept and hard to see. Because that means we also then have to start thinking about, well, what do we do in terms of colonization? Whose land are we on? And then we get back to, we can be easily brought back to these really difficult questions uh, that Canadian society is really interacting with today. Yeah, it, it's surprising, or sorry, it's disappointing, but not surprising to hear uh, that not only are stories here on earth kind of pushed aside to the corners that we we lose history because quote unquote the winners write history but that that's also happening up in the sky in our stars um it's just so sad to hear that that connection and all of that wisdom is sort of being pushed out um because there's winners kind of writing history and i, I was on your twitter today and i saw that you were uh kind of outraged um and i loved it um about you know how more women need to be included in um, stem uh, science and technology um and i'm reminded of when um someone said that men were better at science uh, than women and I, I just think it's so funny because it's like well maybe you could say that women are not as good at male science um but i would argue that males are not as good at female science and that they're completely different ways of looking at a subject through our 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 bodies and minds um so i i would say that that same thing is also happening in the stars that there's a relationship to um that the stories are sort of being pushed aside for the ones that are kind of considered you know stamped and approved um and so it, that's that seems to be such an important part of your work how how did you start this work? Where, where did, what was your entry point into seeing this gaping hole in how we see the stars? Yeah. It, so um, part of my growing up, I never really grew up in a Mi'kmaq community. You know, Newfoundland was never really, I grew up in, on the island of Newfoundland, it was never really considered to have a whole lot of indigenous people. It was very settler, you know, traditional 1980s Canada, beachcomber, Sesame Street, Mr. Dress Up kind of thing. And we never really talked about, you know, Mi'kmaq knowledge or indigenous knowledges. It was, you know, the traditional Western canon. And and so, you know, that came with benefits in that. It was a lot easier for me to go to school and pick up STEM and not have to worry about uh, being prejudiced against because, you know, I'm a very white person. And so nobody's going to assume that I'm some other, that I have to worry about racism or sexism or these things. But what really struck me is, I came back to Canada in 2014 to work at the University of Toronto. And a few years later, I went to a conference called CASCA, which is the Canadian National Society. We have annual meetings. And this year, that year was in Winnipeg. 
and Winnipeg being the intersection of multiple First Nations and Métis peoples, the organizers wanted to have some Indigenous focus. And so they invited mm -hmm. a speaker. The speaker is a Cree elder who, uh, Wilfred Buck, who does amazing work. Like, he takes planetaria, like reserves across Manitoba, doing education and sharing, and, and looking at astronomy as medicine, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Wow. And he, and he was sharing his stories, the stories of the Cree people. And I'm just sitting in this banquet room, you know, sipping stale coffee, lot looking around as people look kind of bored or having their own little conversations and uh, and all these people um well are essentially white and i'm just thinking you know i'm teaching this history of astronomy course you know which is the history of white dudes in astronomy i'm <laughs> not seeing in any textbook indigenous knowledges where are they where are my stories and yeah you know that kind of Motivated me to start digging, and and, that, and the, I'm still digging today, learning how to learning these things. Whether it's learning about indigenous methodologies and native science, and thinking about ethics, uh, and it's still going. And, and but that was kind of I think that was really this the first spark. And you know, and there's so much we still need to do to be more respectful and integrative of not just indig you know when we say indigenous knowledge it's very hard to talk about because there's no one indigenous knowledge there's you know migma inu Cree, mohawk uh salish navajo dene northern dene inuit and so on so many different knowledges and we have and as astronomers and scientists i think we have an obligation living on this land to learn about the science of this land not just in not just bringing in our well this is astrophysics and tell indigenous people how, what it is it's to go to indigenous people and listen and learn and that's and that's something that's a, been a very long path uh, going forward well and what i hear in that story was that someone gave uh an indigenous person a platform and that was one of the catalysts in, of your work. So it just goes to show that if we can amplify more uh, non-white, non-colonial histories, that it does spark a change because of all the, not saying that that was the sole catalyst in your work, but that you, you, you mark it as a defining moment. And it's because someone gave someone else a chance. And so I love that it's being paid forward through your work. When you started to dig in to your own culture's stories, um, what was that like for you to kind of realize what you were uncovering? I heard the story of Mune and the Seven Bird Hunters years ago. Um, I think it was around 2008, 2009. The United Nations had a, a year of astronomy. And the Canadian contribution was to have a group of people try to bring some astronomy knowledges and public publicize them. And what they did is they found a biologist because there was no astronomer at the time who could do this to work with a group of Mi'kmaq out East and to bring the story forward in a public way. So I've always sort of known, I've known the story for a long time, mm -hmm. but I never really got to engage with it in terms of thinking about it in terms of land and people and elders. And that's kind of where I'm still stuck though. I mean, I've come a long ways in learning about, you know, other stories of nations that are not my own. But part of the issue out east is, you know, the land as Mi'kmaq has been colonized far longer than the West Coast, for instance, or Ontario. And so many of our stories have been rewritten and changed <clears throat> that it's hard to really find those discussions anymore. Because, to be honest, many there are so many other issues um, that are kind of at the forefront, whether particularly in Mamagi is the right to fit right to fish mm -hmm. or the right to hunt. And so I'm still very, um, very much a novice at my own nation, stories of my own nation. Uh, I've learned a little bit about the Mi'kmaq moons, thanks to uh, pe people who are working with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I've learned 
some people have reached out and told me about the Mi'kmaq Grand Council flag. This is a white flag with a red cross and a star on the moon and stories about the star on the moon. And, you know, so I'm learning a little bit here and there, but it's been very difficult to actually reconnect directly with my own culture and heritage. Yes. Well, and that's a sadness, I'm sure, to feel like, you know, some stories are truly lost um, that can't be found again because they they left with the with the generations that have passed on. Um, and you mentioned before, you said uh, that the, the speaker at that conference talks about astronomy as medicine. Can you talk a little bit about what, the, what you, that speaker, what you mean, what that means to you? Sure. I don't know if, uh, if Mr. Buck would actually, uh, sorry, <clears throat> I don't know if Mr. Buck would actually say it as astronomy as medicine. I think that's how I took his discussion. Oh, that's beautiful. But he, he goes to, but he goes to communities and he's sharing these stories and he's, and this is a path for people to learn astronomy, to learn about the culture, learn about where they're from. And so this can be done in community, uh, in cultural centers, for, in friendship centers, and it helps just helps people reconnect where they're where they're at and where they're from. And it becomes, I think, a way for people to deal with issues, traumatic issues from the past and today, and ongoing traumas that relate to being indigenous in this country. So, uh, and my own perspective is turning to the more I work on this, the more it feels like medicine to me. It, it feels mm. like you're I'm learning a lot more about where I come from, and that's very important. Yeah, well, in your dark sky story in the beginning, you said that you had uh, it felt like home almost because of the drum circle. Um, is that relating to your heritage at all? Yeah, uh, I mean, the drummers were, were also Cree, and mm -hmm. but I think it was having this dark sky, dark clear sky the music, the singing. Uh, I did not grow up against the Rockies, but I grew up in a very, in the Appalachians that go through mm -hmm. Newfoundland. So it was very, in a valley, very hilly, lots of trees. You have to look out for in Newfoundland, you have to look out for moose, jasper, it's elk. So, <laughs> you know, so in a lot of respects, it, it, did, it did feel like home. You know, it felt like something I recognized. Whereas in Toronto, you know, I have a pretty good view of the city, but, it, you know, at night, I can't really pick out many stars. Uh, chances are it's a plane. Yeah. You know, if I walk if I walk downtown Toronto, I'm more likely to see a star from CBC than I am to see one in the night sky. So it, it, you feel that disconnect. And, and it's yeah. not right. It isn't right. And it's uh, so much of what I think about, too. I think, you know, here you are talking about a disconnection from your own heritage, the disconnection that you see from other Indigenous cultures' heritages. And I also see that on the individual basis, too, that we are all so disconnected from the night sky. And I think it's a meditational epidemic that we are lacking this. You know, we, we talk about meditation like it's this onerous task that we have to get to every day, you know, try to meditate in the morning. And that's great if you can maintain that practice. But actually, meditation was built into our worlds. It was built into our nights because we would sit by a fire, we'd stare at the flame, or we would sit under the night sky and we'd stare up at the sky. And that was a meditation that we're no longer taking. So it's really interesting to hear about you talk about this disconnection culturally that's happening as well. Um, I often just think about it on the individual level um, and what that's doing for us. And I think it's it's so important to think about how on how many levels that it's happening on, um, not just the individual, not just the cultural, but that it's it's really blanching and disconnecting humans from this source of understanding, which I think is a critical part of our mental health today. Do you have students that kind of have aha moments when you're working with them? Yeah, uh, it happens once in a while. You know, students are rare, rarely get to see indigenous stories in the night sky or you know, indigenous knowledges or relationalities. And I think it's very often when we talk about, you know, where 
these stories come from or what the stars look like in this way, students tend, can be surprised. And one of, one of the great things in Toronto, I, I get to work with lots of different students from different backgrounds, very diverse group of people. And a lot of them will then look into their own heritage and tell me their stories. Hmm. And that's, and then we both have, get to have those aha moments. And I think it's kind of important because we, especially in astronomy and physics, because we sort of think of astronomy and physics as both universal and disconnected. Like, <laughs> you know, astronomy is defined on the sense of being objective. So if something's objective, we have no, it, it exists whether I have a relationship to it or you have a relationship to it or somebody else has a relationship to it. And we try to erase that relationship in the, in the name of objectivity. And I think, that also plays into this, this disconnect in some respects. And so I think uh, I found that when students sort of see these stories and see these stars as a, being with different names, different relationships, different perspectives, I think it helps with their appreciation of the night sky and appreciation of astronomy is more than, uh, more than you know, remembering jargon or knowing that <laughs> Ions go around the sun due to Newton's third law and all that stuff. And, and so I think it, create, it helps build that relationship. And I think that's usually the aha I get once in a while. Yeah. So let's get into the astrophysics because I realize we're kind of in the, in the culture of astronomy, but I want to get talk about, so you said you are fascinated by low mass planet hosting stars and their atmospheres and the connections between the measured star and planet properties. Can you talk about this? Yeah. So the last 20 years have been this really exciting time for astronomy. And this is because our techniques for observing stars have become so refined, we can detect the presence of planets around them. And the, one of the easiest ways of doing this is you take your telescope and you just stare at a star much as you can. And every once in a while, if a planet passes in front of that star, it creates a shadow and decreases the amount of light. And that little dip tells you about the size of the planet versus the size of the star. Hmm. And but it gets even more better than that because if we can observe that little dip and we observe it at different wavelengths, so whether it's optical, infrared, ultraviolet, and so on, the, the size of the planet might change or at least the appearance of the size of the planet. And that's telling us about the atmosphere of the planet, as well as the atmosphere of the star, because all everything we're doing is purely stellar radiation. And so we can use these planets and we're going around these stars to sort of characterize both the stars and the planets and, and learn about the relationship between those two objects. And so one thing I'm very interested in is and I've always been very interested in understanding the chemical composition and the makeup of stars in, in general. But we can use these transits to do that for the stars, but also do it for the planet. And then if we're looking, we might be able to find signals of oxygen, which could mean bio biology, or maybe we're finding ammonia as biology, or maybe we're finding some weird abundances in the star, like the star has a whole bunch of oxygen that doesn't, it isn't expected relative to our sun. Then we're learning about the evolution, chemical evolution of our galaxy. We're learning about our, you know, the chemical evolution of that region in the galaxy and all these different things. So we get to understand a whole lot about all the elements and chemistry of stars and planets, as well as the potential, looking, potential for looking for life and looking for technologies and looking for all these different things. I think it's so interesting that you are looking at stars almost with the same love and benevolence that one would have for your own planet. And so do you have a favorite star? Is there one that just calls to you? Oh, there's all kinds of stars. Like they have fun, amazing stories. One of my favorites has always been the North Star. Hmm. And you know, in fact, I have, I've written two or three papers on just the North Star. And this is because it tells so many different stories. So we also call the North Star Polaris. And so Polaris mm -hmm. is one star in a system of three, with three other stars. So it is a binary star orbiting another binary star system. And we can actually watch those stars orbit each other and measure their masses. 
and measure the properties of stars. And so that tells us one story about how these how this system came to be and exist. And it, and the fact of the matter is, the fact that it's a bi it's binary properties are kind of even too weird to be a binary system because the mass we how heavy we measure Polaris versus its age is not consistent with its companion. Polaris is younger than it should be, or appears younger. Oh. And so we're, we're, we're trying to understand, do, are we getting it wrong? Or does Polaris have the secret to the fountain of view? On the other hand, Polaris is also a Cepheid star. A Cepheid star is a massive star that's relatively speaking for itself old because it's evolved and it pulsates. So its light goes up and down mm -hmm. every few days. And the time it takes for the period, or the time it takes for the light to go from maximum to minimum to maximum, called this period, tells us about how much light it's actually emitting. So we use this to actually measure distances. And since we see Cepheids in other galaxies and other galaxy clusters, we use Cepheids for cosmology and measuring the expansion of the universe. But Polaris is the closest one to us. And as a Cepheid, it's actually completely weird. It, we have, we've been observing it for almost 200 years now, so we can actually measure its period as a function of time. So we see how the period changes. And when that, that change in period is actually the star aging and evolving. So it's real time stellar evolution. And it too is weird because it appears to be evolving much faster than our computer models can best reproduce. So it's doing something else. And so this is why it's kind of my favorite start because Polaris is telling us more often than not that we're wrong. Interesting. And it's telling us it has its own stories. And so that tends to be one of my favorite past stars. But you know, I'm also a big fan of you know the star Betelgeuse, which which will keep keeps threatening to explode and psyching us out. <laughs> or even the sun. Just even the sun as a star is a weird star. Because you know, a lot of my colleagues have projects looking for solar analogs or solar twins. We never seem to quite get it right. And so even the sun is, is kind of a weird star, even though we don't even think about it as being anything different than what we would expect. So why is the sun a weird star? Uh, in, in terms of primarily its composition, so one of the key goals in astronomy is try to measure carbon and oxygen in all the different stars, but oxygen is a hard thing to measure. And mm -hmm. it, we keep getting the oxygen wrong in the sun. And so sometimes we have too much oxygen, sometimes we have too little oxygen relative to all the other stars. It's also kind of weird uh, in that for a star of its type, it has a planet Jupiter that's five that's at five astronomical units, whereas most Jupiters we find around other stars are within the orbit of Mercury. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we have so many planets and the structure in the way our solar system structure is actually fairly unique right now. Interesting. And so we get all these weird kind of things we just don't understand, but as well as the solar cycle, which we see in other stars, but we see all this other kind of for lack of a better phrase, wibbly wobbly variation in our solar cycle that we don't really understand or see in other stars. Yes. And all these different relationships we just don't get. And then there's even the fact that for stars like our sun, the vast majority of them are, bo are born in stellar pairs. The sun doesn't have a companion. It doesn't seem to ever have one. And we even, hmm. so we, that's kind of funny. Or stars are born in clusters, typically. We have no idea if we were born in a cluster. Or finally, our solar system is in this weird bubble. And that bubble is the really big bubble. Like it looks like we were actually in a bubble of a former supernova. There's very little gas and dust, interstellar gas dust in certain parts of our night sky, which is also kind of weird. So we're also just in a weird place in our galaxy or a surprisingly weird place. So there's all these little kind of nuances, at least on that astronomical scales that seem to play a role here and we just, it creates all these weird kind of funny stories about our sun. It's interesting. So you're saying there could have been a twin sun and that would have been a very hot earth if that were the case. It depends on where the twin sun was born. Mm. If we could have a Tatooine kind of system like Star Wars, where we're orbiting the two stars independently, or 
It could be a weird one where the star is way beyond us and we're in a solar system and it's way beyond it's interfering with us. We don't know. But mm. the fact that we were born as a single star is, is not even the, is not the most common uh, option. Yeah, it's so interesting. You're, ma you're making me remember a, a little story that happened between me and my mom. But I was I had a book and I was a kid at the time and was reading the book and she was driving. And in the book, it said that the sun would eventually die. <laughs> and I think it's like 50 billion years. Is that what it is? Do you know um, how uh, much? Five longer? billion. Five billion. And we were both so sad by that fact that I had pulled from the book. And we couldn't really explain it because we knew that I, my, our lifespans weren't 5 billion years old, but it's just, uh, it's a memory I, I remember with my mom because we were so sad by the fact that this sun itself has a time limit. Mm -hmm. Do yeah, you ever, and... yeah, do you ever think about that Sorry. connection to life on earth? Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I think about it two different ways. One, I, I think in the sense of, that we're on a, we're, life is precious and we're in this perfect balance where we're just far enough away from our sun and the sun has the right properties where we get to exist and thrive and have nature you know if we were venus or mars it'd be game over like everything's just right for us yeah and in four and a half five billion years the sun's going to become a red giant star and it's going to expand and it's basically going to envelop venus and it's going to look like a giant blotch on the sky and gonna and probably fry wow. the surface of the earth. And so, you know, that will be our end point. But it's also kind of helpful because that means that's another we got that means we got four billion years to live and to continue and maybe find another way. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe we will go out in space and, and live somewhere else. Maybe we won't. But it also tells me this other story is that the sun, we have about 5 billion years, but the sun is also 4.5 billion years old now. Mm. And we live in a galaxy that's about 10 billion years old. That means there's a 5 billion year window where life could have evolved independently around other stars, created civilizations and cultures completely different, maybe more advanced, maybe less than ours. And that means that, I think it gives me hope, because that means life is still going to persist no matter what we do. It's going to be around other stars, which is great. And in my mind, that's like saying, you know, life migrate, migrates from the eastern Canada to Europe or back and forth. And as long as life continues, I think we're still around. Because, you know, if we all come from stars, that means life around other planets is our cousin, is our relations. Yeah. So, that, so I think I'm still filled with hope in that respect. And I think the fact that there's this five billion year window where life can evolve before us. It means there's so much more out there, and we have, and in fact, we got five billion years to go. When something is, we have so much more potential. So maybe we get through climate change, and keep going. We can do. We have so much options to do great things and connect with our galaxy and connect with the universe. Maybe one day, you know, have conversations with other planets. Yeah, and I, I think your work actually is helping to bring and reconnect people to the stars that are seen from Earth and then helping to reconnect um, to our planet. I, I see you're unique in that not only do you love our own planet, but that you, you actually project the, that same type of love for the uniqueness of other planets and stars. But we kind of need that here on Earth more. We're, we've never been more disconnected. And, and what I hear in your story is, is a metaphorical light pollution, that we're polluting the stories of our night sky as well as the night sky itself. How does light pollution enter your work? Actual light pollution. <laughs> Many ways. I think from the indigenous sense, if I can't see the constellations, I can't tell my stories. So light pollution is about mm -hmm. erasing the, those stories. On the mm -hmm. other hand, as a, as a professional astronomer who loves telescopes, light pollution is just a big pain in the neck mm -hmm. and yeah. gets in the way of being able to do anything. And so, 
you know, so if we keep going to light pollution and keep illuminating uh, the night sky, then, you know, the ability to do astronomy becomes even more difficult. And, that, and that's regardless whether we illuminate the night sky and optical as what we think light pollution or with radio signals, which ruin radio telescopes, that all these different signals become noise and overwhelms the ability to to look at the night sky and, uh, and look at stars and galaxies. And, and in that respect, it's just like noise pollution. If, if somebody is playing 6 million different songs at the same time, it's not, there's nothing beautiful about it. It's just painful. And I think that's the same issue with light pollution. It's about, it, it is a form of um, destruction whether it is relative to connection through indigenous cultures and heritage or as a professional astronomer through the inability to do our work and to learn about the next guy or to learn about the universe. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, being in Toronto that you know you look up at the stars or the lack thereof and maybe you're more likely to see a plane. And what's interesting about that example that you give is that that plane is not only a faux star, maybe disorienting wildlife, it's also creating a lot of sound pollution that cuts through the channels um, that birds can talk through. Um, so it's this momentary, complete piece of static interrupting communication visually and also audibly for wildlife. Um, so do you have any opinions about the recent space launch uh, satellites? I've even seen, um, and I was horrified, this is one in one of my presentations, but it was a, a, a rendering of a satellite projecting like Coca-Cola billboards from the stars back down. Um, I, I mean, I'm pretty much can guess your opinion, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of the static that's being put up into the sky. I have a lot of opinions on this. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I've noted, um, I think light pollution erases our stories. I think the goal of these satellites is to rewrite them. And probably, unfortunately, to rewrite them in the image of rich people, yeah. mostly rich white yeah. dudes who look like Dr. Evil. Um, <laughs> and this is going to be a huge issue. Uh, as professional astronomers, already an issue. We see this in astronomical images, the satellites just streaking across the night sky. But I think for humans, this is going to become more and more of an issue as, you know, as these low Earth orbit satellites keep going and in, in invading our view of the night sky like like it's a meteor, constant meteor shower. And who's being asked? Have you know, I've never been asked whether I think this is cool by people who are doing the launch. Yeah. I don't know who has asked those questions. Who asked indigenous communities? And you know, indigenous communities might benefit. You know, broadband internet quite important. And you know, in, in Northern Canada, access to broadband internet is not easy. So there's benefits potentially that we have, but mm -hmm. who's having these conversations? Is that the trade-off we want to have? And so I see these satellites and these constellations and proposed space stations and proposed space billboards as the next frontier of colonization. You know, we, we took North America, settlers took North America under the framework of Terra Nullis where it was claimed that the people here didn't exist because they weren't people, because they weren't Christian. And if, no, if it was nobody's land, that means that we could take it and do what we want. Right now we're doing the exact same thing in space. Mm. Whose land is it or whose space is it? Well, if it's no one's, we can do what we want. We can go up there, we can build our satellite constellations, charge money for internet or do spyware. You know, we can, we can use these satellites for surveillance or tracking, whatever we want. But the people who get this side are the people who get to go up there, who get to fund these missions. And that continues on into lunar exploration and the idea of building bases on the moon, doing mining on the moon. You know, it, it's a lot easier if you're on the moon to get to mine for rare earth elements than it is in many places on earth. And, hmm. you know, having access to rare earth minerals is one of the more important probably goals if you want to dominate markets like computing and soft tech and so on. And then if you want to be 
the Elon Musk of the world, the real goal is, is Mars, for people on Mars, to take Mars, to conquer Mars, to develop Mars, to essentially do the exact same thing that pioneers and settlers and colonizers did in the Americas, but do to Mars. And who gets to say whether we have that right? You know, right now, NASA has sent multiple missions and have we, we have not yet found out whether there is not life on Mars. We, so far, everything has said there isn't life, but we haven't proven it. That's a good point. And so do we send, do we send humans to Mars and say, contaminate it? Do we have that right? Does, does Mars have rights? You know, in today was called New Zealand, you know, and I can never remember the name of the river, but this river was so important in Maori culture that the, the, it was awarded human rights. And those human rights are under, under a custodial relationship with various Maori peoples and Celtic peoples in some committee. And so this is probably the first time, at least in the, you know, the Western world, where a piece of land or a piece of water was given human rights. For decades, corporations had human rights. Does mm-hmm. Mars have rights? Does the moon? Does do we have the right to just contaminate them with ourselves and and our offshore mining or lunar mining or space mining? And if we do all this stuff in space, are we actually doing anything to help us on it? Is that actually going to help us on Earth? You know, uh, the biggest part of getting more rare earths is to create more materials, create more computers, more things to buy. How many, you know, the next generation of iPhones or Galaxy phones. And, you know, therefore, are we creating more waste? So, you know, people, there are people who want to argue for these things as a planet B, as ways to be more environmentally friendly. But it's all about conquering and controlling. And who has the right to make that decision? And right now, the what I see is the right to make that decision is dictated by the size of a person's wallet. Yeah, not their place in the absolutely. Land. It's true. And I have to say that when I was watching the recent space launch, um, that it did seem like a hobby for um, the people involved and that it was uh, an exciting hobby, but it didn't seem like it was rooted in the needs of humanity. It's, it's, it was uh, yet another cool thing flashing across our screens. Um, and I just don't know if the importance was weighted in in it. It didn't feel important. It felt like a bucket list item. And I just don't know if my individual bucket list is really valuable to humanity. So I, I just think that um, it's really impor- it's really interesting to hear your perspective um, and I think that's so true that it's about conquering and control, that it's it's not done with a feeling of the greater good. It's done f- from an individual's desire. And that's maybe a very toxic way to look at venturing out into these other places um, in our universe. I have a question for you. Are, do you have, uh, speaking of hobbies, but do you have something alternate in your world other than astronomy and astrophysics that brings you richness that you bring back to your field of study, like an art or another hobby of yours? That's a good question. Um, you know, the 20, 2020 has kind of uh, shown that I, probably, I definitely need to diversify my hobbies. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I haven't really done a whole lot. You know, I, I enjoy programming, which get, always comes back into astronomy and science. I do, I, I really love art, particularly different uh, indigenous art forms and sculpting and uh, x-ray art and these things, which I'm learning about, uh, but I have no skills. Uh, I, I would ruin a stick figure. <laughs> And so I think for me, it's really been about trying to spend more time uh, learning about indigenous perspectives on different things, whether it's art and education, but also just even going out in nature. You know, uh, when I live in a part of Toronto that's near a, a ridge or ravine, ravine, so the, which is a nice park for walking, 
and just getting away from the noise a little bit. And that's been a, a huge meditation and mm. relax moment of relaxation for me whenever I get to do that. But I really, I think that's one of my big regrets is I really haven't done enough of these different things to really kind of engage in that way. At least not yet. Well, I mean, I don't ask the question so that you feel bad, but what I hear in that yeah. is that you have, I mean, it's wonderful to have a hobby and I always recommend that um, you actually need hobbies uh, to fulfill different mind spaces. So one type of hobby that I think is really important is one that's actually repetitive and doesn't require a lot of big thinking. So like knitting is an example um, because it occupies your uh, enough of your brain space to then let the other parts really run and be free. But one could say that you're doing that by actually getting out and immersing yourself in nature and reconnecting there. Uh, I think that so many, so many times when I do get out and reconnect with nature, I don't even feel the value of it until I get home and the flashes come and those flashes hit me in my, the space that I occupy my home all the time, but that to then bring those flashes inside, it's very enriching to my life and also to my work. So um, when you are lucky enough to be able to carve out time for nature, what, how does that inform your work? Nature is just so, so much beauty, so much, life and death intertwined there's you know you see the water and you just see the all the different forms in the mathematics whether it's you know fractal nature of leaves or the growth pattern of trees and just thinking you know there's so many so much detail here that i don't really think about in astronomy you know one of the jokes mm -hmm. in astronomy is that I'm, within a factor of 10 i got the right answer <laughs> yeah you know, if you do that in chemistry the lab blows up if you do that in biology, you're in the wrong genus and, and or species. <laughs> so, you know, astronomy is kind of fortunate. We get to be, we don't have to be very right to be right. Mm. And I think in nature, it just reminds me of like there's so much details that we don't really see when we're, we're just trying to be within that one order of magnitude, that one factor of 10. And for me, I think it's also just a bit of peace, you know, just a chance to stop thinking and just be, and be in the moment. Uh, yeah. So much of astronomy is planning, analyzing, writing. You know, there's all these different things going on at the same time. And I think just to stop them all, it's very important to, before going back to work. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's so much of what the night sky provided for us, too, which is that it enabled us to just stop, f feel the awe that so naturally comes when you do see a beautiful night sky. And, and just have that emptiness, that interstitial space between our to-do lists and tasks. So I just want to thank you so much for bringing life and light to the other stories, the non-white stories of our skies. I think that is so important. And I think it will be so important in the future, not only for the people um, that want more of their voice heard on Earth, but also to really show how important the night sky is for all living things. So is there anything you would like to leave our listeners with? Yeah, one of the most important things I think about learning the constellations of indigenous peoples is that it reminds us of whose land we're on and where this land, who was on this land before us. And so if you're in Canada or the US or on any place that is indigenous land, just find one of the constellations, find out that story. And just try to remember that constellation when you look when you're out looking at the night sky so that we remember where you are and you know the people who are on this land for time to some memorial that's beautiful thank you so much for sharing your work today well thank you it was a pleasure go to keystonetech.com for dark sky friendly products eliminate unnecessary sky glow with the xfit full cutoff all packs or the high-performance LED area lights. Keystone can also provide you with HID products, transformers, sensors, and LED retrofit kits and fixtures.
everything for your customers' needs. Go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com. Keystone. Light made easy.